Good. So once again, I'm Barbara Glassman. I'm the Executive Director of Include NYC, uh, and I am here um, with my partners and co-directors, uh, Sue Barlow from the Parent Network of Western New York and Jenny Hakowski from Starbridge. Uh, the, our three organizations make up the New York State Transition Partners that's funded by the Rehabilitation Services Administration to provide information and resources for young adults with disabilities and their families on the road to adulthood in New York State. We strongly encourage you to check out our website. Um, nystransitionpartners.org, where we have lots of uh, resources um, and links, um, events, uh, and other opportunities, um, and including this webinar that will be um, uh, housed on th that for future viewing. Uh, we're thrilled with this uh, Falls Learning community to welcome um, Kristen Booth Glenn, who is the Project Director of Dispo Dis Supported Decision Making in New York. Uh, Kristen is currently a university professor and Dean Emerita at CUNY School of Law. In 2012, she retired as a surrogate jug of judge of New York County where she had jurisdiction over guardianships of persons with intellectual disabilities and wrote several groundmaking decisions in that area. She's written and lectured widely um, on the human rights of legal capacity of dis supported decision making and we are very grateful that she's uh, willing to donate her time here today to us to um, inform us more about this important topic. So with that, um, I will uh, send it over to Kristen for her presentation, and I, we will go to the next slide, please. Um, thank you, and I'm sorry for the delay. We really worked hard at getting on um, just technology is technology, and I don't know now whether I have the amount of time that I had before or whether I have 15 I mean, minutes less. No, so you have you you can go ahead. I think we'll be fine. We'll give you a warning if we have difficulties with the time at the end. Okay, well, I'm going to talk really fast because this was time to fit into 50 minutes. So, um, so here we go. So, so this webinar is about supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship. So, I think it's important that we start with what guardianship is because one of the amazing surprises for me in beginning to do this work. Um, is meeting parents who have actually gotten their kids under guardianship and have no idea what that meant. So to be clear, guardianship is the way in which the state takes away a person's right to make decisions in the case of um, people with intellectual disabilities and this statute takes away all of their decisions and gives the right to make those decisions to another person who is called the guardian. Next. So our statute in New York, as I said, removes all legal rights, the right to vote, the right to marry, the ability to contract, who you can live with, who your friends are, whether you can work, et cetera, et cetera, everything. This is not tailored. This is not like what you may have heard about Article 81 or it can only do small things. No, no, no. It's all of the person's rights. Um, so it's not plenary or limited. And it continues forever unless and until you go back into court and you persuade the judge that it is no longer needed. But basically, it's forever. Next. So the question is, given that guardianship takes away all of a person's rights forever, basically, um, why would parents seek it? And I think there are really two main reasons, or at least in our experience, uh, that we've seen that lead to people seeking guardianship. One is, just if you're a parent, you're told you've got to do it. You're told by the school, you're told by a doctor, you're told by a friend, your child is turning 18, um, you're going to lose rights, you're not going to be able to go to the IEP, so you've got to get guardianship. Um, and so people do. And the other reason is because uh, parents see their children as vulnerable. Obviously, we all see all of our children as vulnerable, but the parents of kids with IDD um, have certainly experienced a greater vulnerability. And they are sold on guardianship as a means of protecting their children. Um, next. So, the con again, this is sort of growing both out of our experience and out of the literature. The, the things that are supposed to be solved by guardianship are, first of all, the ability to stay involved in educational decisions. That's when the school tells you you have to get guardianship or else. Um, it's not true. This is where I wish that I had the technical skill to have a wonderful PowerPoint where someone 
jumped up onto the screen and said, but no, and crossed it out. Um, but the answer is no. I mean, you, you can continue to participate. Um, your child can authorize you to participate. There's just no reason why you have to have guardianship in order to continue to be a part of the educational process. Then we hear all the time this incredible story, which is told over and over again by people who are trying to persuade someone to get guardianship, which is, what if your child is in the emergency room and really needs surgery, and, and they say they don't want surgery, and if they don't get surgery, they're going to die, and so unless you're the guardian, they're going to die, and that's why you should get guardianship. So number one, this scenario probably does not happen very often. Probably your child is more likely to be hit by lightning. Um, but it also doesn't necessarily work if you have guardianship. We did an information session um, in Westchester, and, and somebody told this story, and a woman put her hand up, and she said, I'm my child's guardian. And actually, we were in the emergency room, and I said, I'm the guardian, and this is what I want you to do. And the doctor said, we don't care who you are. This is what we're going to do. So, so I think that argument, the, the hypothetical about the emergency room, um, is vastly overblown as a reason. Um, and then I think also that a lot of people somehow believe that if they're guardians, they can protect their children from, from things that their children need to be protected from, like getting pregnant or getting picked up by the police or um, having the police go look for them if they wander off. And again, these are not actually things that guardianship will do for you. It's not a silver bullet. So next. So the question of does it really protect, does guardianship really do what it's, what it's sort of claimed to do or what people assume? First of all, we have very little evidence. We have no idea, as a matter of fact, how many people in New York State are actually under guardianship. I mean, that's sort of shocking. So because we don't know who's under guardianship, we have no idea whether it's working for them or not working for them. Although we also know um, that there are many, many more people with intellectual disability who are not under guardianship and who are out there in the world probably doing OK, getting support from friends and family members and loved ones and whatever. Um, but, but we don't know. There's certainly no proof that it protects. Um, we do know that there are these sporadic uh, stories in the press about abuse and neglect. There are occasional cases um, that show where guardians have misused their power. Um, those are mostly about money, which I guess is because it's mostly what the press wants to cover, but they're mostly about money. But nonetheless, um, certainly guardianship is not always protected. There is no court oversight. Once a judge appoints someone as a guardian of a person, whether it's a person with IDD or an older person, but under our statute, under 17A, the court never finds out what happens. There's no requirement that you report about how the person is doing or whether you're helping them become more independent or how their health is or whether they're getting services they need. The court knows nothing. It goes on forever. No oversight. It also, guardianship also creates conditions for isolation and possible abuse. I mean, the real power that guardianship gives to a guardian is the power to isolate. And while, you know, when we're talking about parents and, and their kids and trying to do the best, that's not what we're thinking about and it's not likely to happen um, if there's a substitute guardian down the line or if there is no substitute guardian and the state gets involved. Um, isolation is really the power that the guardian has. And isolation is breeding ground for abuse and neglect. And finally, and I think this is really the most important, um, when you make all the decisions for someone else, they lose the opportunity to make decisions, to make good and bad decisions, to learn from the good decisions they made, and to learn from the bad decisions they made. And so the whole possibility of growth um, and a future of inclusion and of self-determination is really very limited or lost by the process of guardianship in which those decisions are made by someone else. And even if the guardian consults with the person and you know, tries to do what they want, still that person who's under guardianship has the experience of going to the doctor's office and having the doctor look at the guardian, of going to the bank and having the, doc of the banker look at the guardian. Um, so it really does curtail the ability to grow and to learn how to make good and healthy decisions. Next. So I think it's useful when we think about protection 
to look just a little bit at history, which teaches us quite a lot. And one of the things that it teaches us is that the um, solution to protect people with IDD has really changed over the years. And one protection has supplanted another. So up until about the 1880s, when we were pretty much an agrarian society, um, people with IDD lived in the community. And maybe they were seen as special, but there wasn't anything special done for them. And maybe they were seen as a little slow. And maybe they did certain kinds of jobs, but they weren't segregated. And then as we became more industrialized and a more literate society, um, the idea of special schools in order to teach people with IDD skills that they needed in a setting with other people like them grew up. And it started in a benevolent way, but it rapidly deteriorated into not very good institutions at all. But parents were told that this was something that was necessary to protect their children. Um, that being with others like them and not being in the outside world where they would be abused and exploited was the best thing for them. And so parents did it because parents want to protect their kids. And that was the alternative they were given. And that went on really through the 1960s until Willowbrook, which hopefully many of you are too young to remember. But it was a huge expose of the Willowbrook quote unquote state school uh, on Staten Island, which was a hellhole of the worst order. Um, you can Google Willowbrook, and you can still see the tapes that were part of that expose. And it's just horrifying to imagine that anything like that happened in the United States. So parents who thought they were protecting their kids suddenly discovered that their kids were being abused, and they were lying naked on floors, and that they were catching diseases, and so forth. And, and, the, and then there was this move toward deinstitutionalization. And so the kids came home. And now they were you know, 19 or 23 or 33. And the parents didn't know what to do. And so parents' organizations, like the ARC, went to the legislature and said, you know, we have to have legal power over our kids. We have to have the right to make decisions. And so 17A, the guardianship statute that I spoke of, was passed in 1969. And that was the answer. That's how you protect your kids. Now, it's been 40 years, almost 40 years. And a lot has happened during that period. Um, we've had the ADA. We've had the IDEA. We have the Rehab Act. And we think very, very differently in this country about people with disabilities of all kinds. We think about accommodations. We think about, in, about the importance of inclusiveness. And so this model of guardianship, which was the only thing parents were offered in 1969, really doesn't fit with our current ideas about what people with intellectual disabilities are capable of or what they're entitled to as, as members of our society. Um, so the question is, what is the next thing? And what I hope to persuade you is that it is supported decision making. OK, next. So supported decision making is an alternative to guardianship. And the good things about it are, if you use supported decision making, your loved one or the person um, will never lose their rights. They will maintain all their legal rights. It will allow them to take risks and to learn from bad choices. It also creates, um, and you know, we'll be talking more about how it works, a network of supporters, which means that there are a lot of eyes watching out for the person, that they're not isolated, that if something goes wrong, some decision goes south, there'll be somebody there to know and to be able to help and to be able to extricate them. And finally, because all people have a human right to make their own decisions, including people with disabilities. So you may ask, what is supported decision making? Next. This is a definition that I like. It's kind of academic, um, but it's useful. Uh, because what it says is that supported decision making is a series of relationships practices, arrangements, and, and agreements of more or less formality, put a pen in that, but all are designed to enable trusted people to help a person with a disability make his or her own decisions, and where necessary, communicate those decisions to third parties. Next uh, slide. So supported decision making can take many forms. That goes back to the series of relationships, practices, et cetera. It can be completely informal. Um, no agreement, no facilitation, no coming to visit us at SDMNY. Just your person with IDD in the world. You have family. You have friends. You live your life. They help you do it. They help you make decisions. We never know about it. We don't call it SDM, but it's obviously going on. And I would 
venture to guess that that's probably the vast majority of people. Um, second is circles of support, which you may know from some uh, practices of agencies. Then the third kind is uh, more formalized supported decision making, which uses a facilitation process to work with the person with intellectual disability, who I will now tell you, this is not even a spoiler alert, we don't call the person with an intellectual disability, we call the decision maker. So I'll be using that term, decision maker or DM from now on. Um, and that's what we do. And that process ends in a written agreement called the SDM and uh, the SDM. And then the most formal way of all is when the legislature passes a statute that says, this is what supported decision making is. Here's the form that you need to fill out once you have other people have to recognize it. And that's sort of, that's the end game. Uh, and it's an end game that we're hoping to get to in New York, but we're not anywhere near yet. Next slide. So where does this come from? There are really two places. One is everybody's experience, and you can think about this for yourself, that when we make decisions, we neurotypical people, people with or without disabilities, we don't do it in a vacuum. We ask other people, we consult with friends and family, um, we may hire experts, we might hire an accountant to help us decide how much taxes to pay or a real estate agent to help us decide you know, where to move and, and so forth. Um, so decisions are all really relational. They're not a person by themselves in a room with no input. And yet, in a way, that's kind of the test that we have for whether somebody needs a guardian or not. And it's, a, it's completely unrealistic, given how everybody else makes decisions. And so what we need to recognize is that people with IDD um, also use supports. They just may need more supports or different kinds of supports. The second uh, place from which supported decision making, and particularly that it is now called supported decision making and that it is wending its way into policy and law and so forth, is really from human rights. Um, the human right of every person to make his or her own decisions. Um, and just hang on to that for a second because I'm going to come back to human rights. So, but let's go to the kinds of support that a person might need um, that might be different from or the same as a person who doesn't have. Next slide. So you, this could be a huge list. It could be pages and pages long. But just kind of in summary, um, a person might need someone to gather information for them. We might do that ourselves when it's, for example, a medical decision or buying a car or whatever. Um, they might need a person who will explain that information in simple language or several times or whatever it takes in order for them to understand it. Um, they might need help in identifying the possibilities and alternatives. You, know, you think you want to do X, but there's also Y. Do you want to think about Y? Then aiding the person in thinking about the consequences, not only of making a decision, but like what happens if you don't make this decision? Then, and this is particularly true, obviously, of uh, people with IDD who don't communicate verbally or in traditional means, communicating the decision that the person has made to third parties and finally, um, helping the person to implement that decision. Next slide. So that's the, it comes out of our common experience, and these are the kinds of supports we might provide. What about human rights? I, I, I always want to bring this in, even though it takes a little bit of time, because they're really an important way of looking at the world. It's much more affirmative than our kind of constitutional rights, which are all about the government can't interfere with your right to carry a gun. These are about the rights that people need to grow and thrive in the world and that they have simply by virtue of being born human. Um, they are based on equality and non-discrimination, as many of our laws in the ADA is, but also a core principle of human rights is human dignity. And I think that for this population, dignity and respect is absolutely critical because the existence of stigma, the existence of prejudice in this um, world against people with disabilities means that you know, they, they are at risk of being treated like objects. And they are people, and they needed to be, need to be recognized as people and treated with dignity. And that's what the human rights framework does for them. So where in human rights does this come from? Next slide. Um, there are a number of human rights conventions. They started in 1948 after World War II, and that's sort of where the whole human rights movement 
came from, um, and they were first reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and then in a series of additional conventions, most recently the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And Article 12 of that convention says that everybody has the right to make legal decisions and to have those decisions legally recognized. It's not enough to say, I want to open a bank account. The bank has to be willing to honor that decision and open it for you. It's not enough to say, I want to see this dentist and have this tooth taken out. The dentist has to accept it. And um, Section 3 of Article 12 is really the key to what we're talking about. It recognizes that people with disabilities may need supports in order to exercise that right of legal capacity. And even though the convention itself does not use the term supported decision making, um, the document, the uh, general comment that came out after from the body that's charged with interpreting, talks a lot about supported decision making as the means for people with disabilities to exercise their legal right to legal capacity. Next slide. So this is just a picture of, and it's actually a little bit out of date, of how widely um, adopted this convention is that virtually every country in the world has ratified this convention and or ratified what's called the optional protocol. You don't need to know about that. Those are all the reds and blues on this chart. And there are only now three countries in the world that have not ratified the convention. Sudan, not a great place. North Korea, not such a great place and the United States. Um, the U.S. did sign the convention uh, shortly after Obama was elected, but it has never ratified it. The U.S. doesn't like to ratify, the Senate doesn't like to ratify human rights conventions, um, and so we are really the outliers here and not in very good company. But the reason that I show you this um, is because a lot of stuff is going on around the world, and that gives us a huge knowledge base of how this can um, even as we are way behind in the U.S., way behind many other countries in the world. So next slide. Um, because many of the countries who have signed this convention and ratified it are actually taking it seriously, um, there are many, many efforts to change, the guard to change or abolish guardianship laws um, around the country. Ministries of Justice have set up commissions. There's draft legislation. Many, many countries have very significantly limited and rolled back and put constraints on their guardianship um, legislation. Um, and if I had been speaking to you three weeks ago, I would have said, but nobody has yet fully abolished guardianship and established supported decision making. But actually, three weeks ago, Peru did. Go figure, Peru. Um, so we do now have an example of one country that has totally abolished guardianship and has established a system of supported decision making that honors people's rights to um, exercise their legal capacity. But the other thing that's happened is that in a number of countries, people have begun pilot projects really starting in 2008 to show that by using supported decision making, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people on the spectrum, people with CP, um, and to some extent people with traumatic brain injuries, who ordinary folks could look at and say, this person can never make a decision, actually, with supports, can and do make decisions and can live more inclusive lives. So next slide is just a pilot, is a slide of some of the pilots next around the world to give you an idea. Um, and I've been very fortunate to have worked with a number of these pilots, um, including Bulgaria and the Czech Republic and Kenya. And Australia, where probably the most pilots and the most developed pilots are, um, the person who's sort of the mother of the process there uh, actually came and worked with us here at SDMNY for four days, um, training us in the model that they use in Australia. So next slide is just a quick, um, this is just to show you that this is not a fringe operation. Supported decision making really is something that is now incredibly quickly into the mainstream. Um, it really started in around 2012, 2013. By 2014, ACL, which is the um, Administration for Community Living in the federal HHS um, that has jurisdiction over people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
came out in favor. They've funded the National Resource Center. They've funded projects. They've funded all kinds of stuff. Um, they're completely behind it. You can go on their website and, and they tell you they are. Um, in 2015, much to everyone's surprise, because it's probably the last place in the world you would have imagined this would happen, at the same time that I was saying, well, no, no place in the world has yet passed a statute that recognizes supported decision-making agreements. And then, wow, Texas did it. Um, followed the next year by Delaware. And in the same year, there were you know, statements in support from AIDD, from um, the ARC, National ARC. Uh, you'll find that local ARCs have done it too, from the Social Security Administration, from the National Guardianship Association, and on and on. Um, the next year, the American Bar Association passed a resolution. The Uniform Law Commissioners changed uh, the uniform guardianship law to require that um, people, that petitioners try supported decision making, and judges insist that they try supported decision making before guardianship um, might be imposed. And just this year, Wisconsin, Washington have passed, Washington D.C. have passed supported decision making laws with. Alaska's past law waiting on the governor's desk, and about eight other states at various stages. So it's really, really happening. Next slide. And it's also happening in the courts, where judges are saying, when people are walking in saying, I want guardianship for my child or my loved one, um, but have you tried supported decision making, and why don't you go try that first? Because it's much less intrusive, and we can't impose guardianship and take away all of somebody's rights if something less restrictive would serve the purpose. Um, so that's supported decision making in a, in a very fast uh, overview. And now let me tell you who we are and what we're doing and hopefully interest you in our process. So next slide. SDMNY is a collaboration um, between Hunter and other, at other parts of CUNY. I'm from the law school, as you can see. Um, the New York Alliance for Innovation and Inclusion, which is a statewide agency Association of Provider Agencies, the ARC of Westchester, which is a very large provider, and Disability Rights New York, which is the protection and advocacy agency, the sort of legal arm um, for people with intellectual disabilities in New York. Um, we got a five-year grant from the um, New York State Developmental uh, uh, Planning Council, DDPC, um, and we are now in our third year to do an education campaign pilot program. And again, I'm really happy to be talking now because we spent the first year of the project developing a model of facilitation that would work for the very diverse, I mean diverse in race, in ethnicity, in language, in economic status, in rural, urban, suburban, et cetera, et cetera, um, work for everybody. Um, in, in the amount of time we had with the resources that we had. And we did a lot of fine tuning of that over the first year. And then we spent the next year actually testing it out and again fine tuning as we went along. Um, and the wonderful, wonderful news is that at the end of two years, we see that we have a model that really works. And I'll be talking about that model quickly in, in just a moment. Um, but at this moment, we have 53 people who are in or who have gone through our program. and it's. It's just breathtaking. I can't tell you how excited I am um, at, at how we really, I think, have nailed it. So next slide. Our objectives, as I said, uh, based on the grant, our education, facilitation, I'll turn to that in just a second, um, and then transformation. Because we think if this works and people with intellectual disabilities really are seen as making their own decisions, if we acknowledge that we all use support, and that there's nothing weird about it or or that you're a less less of a person because you use support, that the way the world sees people with uh, disabilities is going to be different as well and make for a much richer and more inclusive life for this population. So next slide. So I said we have two uh, facilitation projects. One is diversion and one is restoration. So the what we do here is that we facilitate people with IDD, who, as I said, we call the decision makers to choose people, trusted people in their lives who will support them in making their own decisions in specified areas, um, and then to enter into a written agreement with those people that spells out sort of what they want and what the folks are going to give them, and that's the SDMA. 
Next slide. So for the diversion project, what we're doing is looking at people who are at risk of guardianship. And as I'm sure you know, probably the people on this um, webinar know, that the main moment in which people seek 17A guardianship is for transition age use. It's because the school told you it's because the kid turns 18, and, and that's when you do it. So 18 to 21 is, is when the vast majority of 17As happen. Um, and so, the, so that was our target population, although in the diversion project we have people you know, as late as in their 50s where somebody is still saying, you know, I don't know if this is working, I think I'm going to seek guardianship. So what we're doing in this pro project is doing the facilitation um, and, and ending with the agreement and hoping and believing that that will solve the problem, that will provide the protection, that will give the confidence to the person who might have thought about getting guardianship and who will now say, you know, supportive decision making is a better choice. The restoration project is for people who are already under guardianship. Um, and, and what we have found is that there are a lot of parents who just got guardianship because they were told to. Um, in many counties, it's really easy to do. You just fill out some papers. You never actually have to be in court with a judge. The person who is being put under guardianship is never in court. So it's real easy to do and real easy to not understand the consequences. And when this, these people find out, oh, this is what I did. I took all of my child's legal rights away. Um, they want to get out. And, and many other people who have been functioning in the world with supports or who just think they need a little more supports and are prepared to do this process um, also uh, can have their rights restored. And so if a person who is under guardianship goes through our process and signs the supported decision-making agreement, um, DRNY, the PNA, will, uh, this is all free, by the way, I should tell you, all free, um, will go into court and seek termination of the guardianship, and the facilitator will go in, and I'll go in and talk about supportive decision making, and maybe some of the judges who are on advisory council will say, yeah, we think this is a great idea, and the person will get their rights back. So that's the two projects. And now let me tell you very quickly what our facilitation process is. Next slide. So the cast of characters is the person with IDD, who you already know, we call the decision maker or the DM. The facilitator, the facilitators are all given two days of intensive training, a 90-page manual, um, and have constant supervision by a mentor. Um, that's the third person who is experienced in all of this and who is advising and checking in. Um, and the facilitators are all volunteers. Nobody is getting paid, and they range from folks who work in agencies to um, social work students and occupational uh, therapy students at CUNY and ultimately, hopefully, in other uh, SUNY schools around the state um, to just people who are interested and, and want to give back to the community. Uh, interestingly enough, in, in Bulgaria, where I have worked, by about the fourth year of their project, a number of their facilitators were parents of young people or not so young people who had gone through the process successfully and they just wanted to give back. Obviously a parent can't be a facilitator for their own child, but I think it's a testament um, to how well this works and how pleased people are with it that folks who have been through it as somebody who was looking at guardianship or who was a guardian now want to help teach other people how to do supportive decision making. Um, and then finally, the fourth uh, group of characters are the supporters, and those are the people who are actually chosen by the decision maker. Okay. Next slide. At the very heart of the facilitation process are what we call the big four. Um, those are, and, and they're addressed in, in each of the three phases, and they are the substance of the supported decision making agreement that is signed at the end, and they are which areas the DM wants to receive support in, and you know, some choices here, health, finances, education, et cetera. Who she or he wants to provide support in any given area. And it could be different people. Mom could do health, dad could do money, sister could do relationships, the basketball coach could do something else. Um, and, and you could have more than one supporter for each, or you could have one supporter for everything. That's all the DM's choice. Then what kinds of support she or he wants to receive in each area. That really goes back to the kinds of support, um, the slide that I showed you towards the beginning. 
and the DM can say, you know, I want information, but I don't want you to give to help me weigh options, or I want you to help me communicate, but I don't want you to explain, explain or whatever. Um, and finally, how he or she wants to get that support, and that's logistics. It's like if the mom and the sister are supporting in healthcare, um, and the DM, you know, wants everybody to have a meeting, but the mom and the sister have, you know, live in different cities, or they have different work schedules, or whatever, then they might negotiate to do it by skyping or separately. It's, it's a logistical issue. So that's that's what is sort of being discussed at every stage. And now let's go to the actual three phases. Next slide. So in phase one, the facilitator works directly with the DM and just you know, gets to know them, explores what kinds of decisions they're making now, what they find hard, what kinds of decisions might be coming up in the future, how they use support, if they use support, et cetera. They work through a worksheet and then a chart with the big four. And then they address the question of what people in your life do you think you want to have as supporters? Those folks are then invited into phase two. Um, and phase two is the facilitator working with the supporters to educate them about supportive decision making, what it is, why it's good, where it comes from, et cetera. And also what we call repositioning them from being the person who knows what's best and makes the decision to the person who allows the DM to make his or her own decisions but supports them in doing that in whatever way the chosen. This is a process, you know, that we go through with our neurotypical kids as well. It just isn't spelled out exactly as precisely as it is here. And then finally, when those folks have bought in um, and see the difference and commit to being supporters, then we move to phase three, when everybody sits around the table and negotiates the agreement. And again, it's the big four, the which, who, what, and how. Um, they might go through several drafts. Areas might be added, areas might be subtracted, supporters might be added or subtracted. Uh, this is a very individualized process. And eventually, they sign the agreement. Um, I should also say, because I know everybody wants to know this, how long does this take? The, session, the, the, um, the meetings are usually an hour. We try to cap it at that because of people's attention span and time. Um, they usually happen, this is New York City, where people's lives are so crazy, maybe once a month, also allows people to process in between them. And typically, uh, it will take between six and nine meetings to get to an SDMA. Um, and there could be four in phase one, one in phase two, and you know, two in phase three. It could be any, any combination of those. And it could be longer, or it could be shorter, but six to nine months is it's sort of the average for us. Um, next slide. Every supported decision-making agreement um, does contain this one provision, which is that it's the decision-maker's agreement, that he can revoke it, he or she can revoke it, change supporters, um, change areas, uh, or, or whatever he or she chooses to do. And I think it's really important to, to point out that this flexibility really works for everybody because it means that the agreement about the fact that the decision maker is willing to and wants to and requests support is not intended to last for a week or a month or a year. It's intended to really be a process that he or she will use throughout his life or her life. And things can change. That Somebody can become so adept and develop so much capacity in making a particular kind of decision that he or she may not need support at all anymore in that area. Or a new area can come up. I mean, somebody could have a child, for example, and then they might need assistance in child rearing um, and decisions about family that were quite different than what they were thinking about when they were 18. People can move away, or people can not be able to be supporters anymore, or parents can get sick and die. Um, but everybody can be replaced, again, at the DM's choice. And so what this means also for parents, I think, is an assurance that over time, there is always a system in place that will provide the support that's necessary for their child, their loved one, to make good and healthy decisions. Um, next, next slide. The, what's the purpose of the supported decision-making agreement? Well, for one thing, it shows us that we did our job and we got to the end of the process. We don't, we don't really leave you there. We're around to consult. Uh, we'll check in every six months and whatever. Um, but that's kind of the end of our job. 
so it signals that. It formalizes the agreement in a way that's very helpful. It's written, so if people become confused about their roles or start to get too bossy or start to move into areas that they didn't, that the DM didn't want them in or something, you can always go back to the agreement and say, but this is what we agreed. Um, it allows for flexibility. As I said, all these things can be changed as circumstances change. It demonstrates that there is a clear system in place um, that is a less restrictive alternative to guardianship. So for the restoration cases, that's what the agreement does. And for the uh, parent or whoever it was that was you know, thinking about petitioning for guardianship again, or the judge who is considering whether now to impose guardianship, there's something else and it's better and it doesn't strip a person's rights. And also, when we have enough people who have done it and it's working, we can go to the legislature in New York and say, look, we need a supported decision-making law in New York as well. Um, let's go to the next slide, because the question is, what's the legal effect here? And at this moment in New York, unlike Texas and Washington and Wisconsin and Delaware and, the D and D.C., um, third parties don't have to accept it. They can. Um, you can walk in and say, I'm the supporter, and I'm going to communicate the decision. And the third party can say, that's great. What is it? Or the third party can say to you, you know, I don't know that you're the supporter, and I don't know anything about supporting, and you know, this person is going to chair, and I can't understand what they're saying, and so I'm only going to deal with you if you become a guardian. And that could still happen. We hope it won't, but it's why we need legislation. Um, but it is the case that we are working, and I think we're getting very close um, to government um, agencies, unlike third parties, because we're funded by the government, and the government stands behind what we're doing, um, trying to get OPW in particular um, to do an internal regulation and memo saying you know, anybody in front line or front door has to accept a supported decision-making agreement. And we're also working with the Department of Education on that. So hopefully that will be something that we can offer you quite soon. Um, now, having, having spoken quickly and rushed through uh, an awful lot in a very short period of time, I think the questions that probably you would be most interested in knowing are, what's the effect of this um, facilitation process on the people who are involved in it? Not, what do I have to say about it, but how is it actually working um, in, in reality? And so if we're on the next slide, which is what is the effect of the facilitation process on parents who would otherwise have sought guardianship, um, we have best story. We just made this video uh, this week, and uh, Beth, who is a mom and somebody who we met at an information session at a partner school, will now, I hope, I hope the technology will do this for us, um, tell you how this experience has been for her. So let's cross our fingers. Somebody tell me if it's on, because I can't hear anything. I'm not. Hello? It is not playing yet, but I think Nancy's working on it. OK. Nancy? It's starting now. Oh, great. And then you'll tell me when it's over? Yes, but we don't have sound. No, but you can tell me, so I'll know to start up again. Yes, but the video doesn't yet have sound. The video doesn't have sound? Then there's really no point, because even though Beth is lovely, I think Nancy's working on it. We'll see if she can get sound. How about now? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, my girl. Okay. Hold on. Hang on.
Is it working? Uh, no, um, Nancy. Why don't we just um, move let move beyond and skip the video since we're short on time? Okay. So we're on no, the I'll next slide. We're on the next slide, Kristen. What is the effect of uh, supported decision making New York facilitation process on decision makers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I see, see you have our friend Trina on the screen, who I'm very excited to see. Yeah, but if we don't have sound, what good is it going to do? Uh, is Trina also a video? Yes. Ah. She has sound. She does?
So I just want to say, if, if you saw that Trina was reading, um, I want you to know that she wrote that statement herself. We, no one wrote it for her, um, and she just felt more comfortable having thought it out in advance and, and written it. I think it's so wonderful the way she thinks about her parents and how hard it is um, for them. And I just tell you that the, uh, that the parent that you didn't see would have told you that uh, we, we from SDMNY came to an information session at her school, at her child's school, son's school, and that she had literally started the guardianship process and she put it on hold and her son has now gone through the entire process. He's about to sign his agreement and she says that she's so happy that there was something that wouldn't take his rights away, that they were really struggling with that. But she also says, and this is something that we've seen a lot in this process, that we really see the decision makers grow and take responsibility um, and they grow in ways that, that the parents or whoever the potential petitioners were might not even have imagined. It's, it's really an amazing thing. Um, and so there's that as a, as a plus as well as the fact that they are um, not necessarily under guardianship. But I want to go back very quickly to um, the question of protection. So if we could have that slide. Because people are still afraid about protection. And so why is supported decision making as good, if not better, than guardianship? First of all, as I say, it does create the circle of supporters, um, many eyes on the person, and that they're there to protect against abuse and neglect. And even if one of the supporters is like getting a little pushy or trying to exercise undue influence or whatever, the other supporters will see it and will be able to take action. It also, and I think this is really, really important, um, and this language comes from a recent huge 300-page report from the National uh, Disability Council, Council on Disability, which is a federal agency, that studied guardianship and alternatives to increase and improve self-determination. What they say is that supported decision-making fosters self-determination, which results in being more independent, more integrated into the community, better problem solvers, better employed, healthier, and better able to identify and resist abuse. And then, next slide. And they go on and conclude, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities learn through the process of making decisions. It's not about protecting someone, it's about teaching them how to best protect themselves. And I think for parents who are not always going to be around to protect their kids, this is really an important message. Um, next to last slide, which is where we are today. This number keeps changing. Um, in New York City, we have 53 people who are in the process or at the end of the process. We, uh, there are a bunch of folks who have um, gotten to their, to their SDMA, but we haven't had them sign yet because we want to have a big celebration and everybody signed together, but there are many of them. Um, last year we started a, a site in Westchester. It's fairly small, but it's still there and it's being run by our partner, the Ark of Westchester, for those of you who are in Westchester. And uh, later this year, which is to say literally almost immediately, we're going to be rolling out into the Rochester area um, and into the capital area and a bit later in the end of this year or the beginning of next year in Long Island. So, last slide. Um, we have a website. Um, much information is on it. If you or someone you know is interested in participating, you can contact us. You can sign up. Uh, we'll do a one-on-one -on -one conversation or meeting or whatever works 
Uh, if you're interested in being a facilitator, we're doing a training at the end of this month, and there's information about that on the website and lots of other stuff and resources. I'm sorry that we've had so little time and that we had these technical difficulties, um, but I hope that this has been useful and helpful. And again, even though we're talking about very um, concrete problems and issues in people's lives, think also about human rights and the right to dignity because it's what we want for everyone, including our loved ones with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kristen, and thank um, you so much for sharing this important information with our community. Uh, Nancy, do we have any time for questions? Or I know we've, we've run a bit over. Can you bring them up? We actually have um, a few questions. Let me just take a look at them and make sure that um, um, are there any benefits to guardianship? Under what conditions or circumstances is guardianship helpful for the family and individual? And I think you covered most of that. Um, let me just yeah. continue. Yeah. I mean, do you want to do you want to address it at all? Because there is some other yeah, questions. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I think that the benefits are largely illusory. Um, you know, the idea that if you're a guardian, you can you know keep your young adult daughter from getting pregnant. It's just not true unless you lock her up. So what it does is it gives you the power to lock people up. You know, that's what it does, basically. And otherwise, if they're in the community, and, it, and if they're obviously in a group or something, it gives you the power to instruct the staff. Um, but there certainly, there certainly don't seem to be very many benefits to the person, him or herself. And, and I think there are the downsides that I talked about. I mean, what you really want to think about is why do I want guardianship? And, and then is the reason that I want it actually going to be solved by guardianship? And I think in most instances it won't be, but supported decision-making and going through this process may very well be a much better solution for you. Okay, great. So here's another question. Is the facilitator manual something that is intense, or can a savvy person learn it on their own by reading the manual? Not sure even if it's available, just thought it was worth asking. Yeah, it's not hi, available. Hi, Colleen. It's not available to the general public, and that's because we're a pilot project, so we really want to have integrity with our process, and we really, um, well-meaning as people might be, we don't want people going on, you know, in the outside that are not connected to us, that we haven't trained, that we're not mentoring, that we're not, that we don't have constant communication with and doing some, you know, some variation on this. So, no, it is not available now. If you choose to become a facilitator, you'll certainly have it. Um, and at some point in the future, you know, all of this is going to roll out in different ways. But what we want is is to really show that this process has integrity, that it's not just asking a person to sign a piece of paper, which they may or may not understand, where the supporters may or may not understand really what their obligations are, um, but that they've been through a process that's being externally evaluated, that's being fine-tuned, that is you know, what DDPC is paying for. And then, you know, at the end of the five years, it may look very different and we may be putting out um, facilitation manuals for everybody, but right now, no, sorry. Okay, next question is, can I get a copy of the PowerPoint? And the answer is, it'll get posted on our website next week. Um, and then the other question is, is there an exact date for the facilitation process for DMs in the Rochester area? And that's our last question. Oh, so my understanding is that the Rochester project will be training facilitators, I think maybe at the end of this month or next month. Um, the, the lead agencies there are Starbridge and um, Catholic Charities or Catholic something. Um, so if you are interested in Rochester, why don't you call Starbridge? Or there's probably a way to make that connection on our website. But first they'll train the facilitators, and then as soon as they have the facilitators trained, they'll open up for taking in DMs. Uh, and we can make that information available through our monthly access that most people on this call probably receive, so that if anyone wants to participate in that process, they will, ha they will have that information there. Great, thank you. Um, 
So if that is our final question, that was Sue Barlow from um, Parent Network of Western New York posing the question. So thank you, Sue, and thank you again, uh, Kristen Booth Glenn, for sharing your information uh, with us uh, today. We were ve we're very grateful to have had you, and thank you all to our participants. Um, have a good afternoon. Don't forget to vote. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> <laughs> Primary.